So thank you, everybody, for joining the last session of the Agile UX Virtual Summit uh, for 2017. Uh, this week has passed by pretty fast, and it's been great seeing everybody join. We had over 22,000 registrants, um, and we had as many as, uh, as over 2,000 folks live at one time um, in some of the sessions. Uh, so it's been a great turnout seeing everybody here. And today for the last session, um, we have a pretty in-depth presentation from uh, Vera, who is a design manager at IBM. And with that, I will pass this over to her and she can describe how she balances design thinking as well as agile at IBM. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be talking to you. And uh, I do hope you enjoy this session. And I hope we get great questions. So today, we'll spend some time speaking about design thinking and agile. If you remember nothing about what I say today, I need you to remember that you can do agile without design thinking. So you can do agile. You don't need design thinking. However, anytime you do design thinking, you are by nature doing agile. So design thinking is inherently agile in its framework and it's all the processes that we do. So what we'll be talking about today. Yep. Um, oh, and uh, there are a few yeah. people here were requesting, uh, let's switch to full screen mode here. So, oh, of course, I'm sorry. Um, no worries. Sorry about this. Um, just a second. Okay, where is it? Of course. Is this better for everyone? Uh, this is the presenter view. So I think what we can do is let's just play the slideshow. That will. Okay, hold on a second. So go back. Sure. Uh, play slideshow. Uh, which one do you want me to? Sorry. Let's do... <laughs> you know, we are very organized and now we are like, okay. Yeah, no worries. Let's try present from beginning. That should be the one, I think. Okay. Uh, oh, display settings, perhaps, right there. Let's try clicking into display settings. Okay. Here, try that. Uh, try this one. Okay. There we go. That's the one that everyone can yep. see? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, so with this slight delay, we're back to talking about design thinking and agile. What I'll cover tonight is the origins and how the two methodologies, frameworks evolved, assuming that some of you are novices to design thinking and to agile. I'll cover a little bit of that sort of as a framework, and then we'll go into how design thinking and agile are integrated. Lessons learned, and then taking any of your questions. So the first question that people very often have and the concern that they uh, encounter when they start talking about design thinking and agile, they say, hey, one is more of the developers, the agile, and the other one is more of the creative types, the visuals. And some people even think that there's an inherent conflict or that design thinking and agile methodologies are not that they're actually enemies or they cannot be aligned. So how do we answer this question? Think about yourself. Think on this chart. Would you consider yourself a left brain person or somebody who is more on the right, right brain side? And again, we can argue that that distinction in many ways, uh, some people take it very seriously. Some people um, have different interpretations and we all have different tendencies. The answer for tonight's presentation is that in order to do design thinking and agile successfully, you need to use your whole brain. So in a way it's an agglomeration or it's a it's you're using both sides of your brain, both your analytical, logical <coughs> logical side and also much more of your creativity. And they have a lot in common. So here I will go into certain things that both design thinking and agile have in common. Above all, 
of these, the blue circles that you see. Above all, it's all about the user. Make the user your North Star. Really focusing on user-centered outcomes and designing everything for the user. And then we have this notion. And here, when we talk about um, the North Star, I want to reiterate again that when we think about stars, there are more stars in the universe than there are pieces of sand on Earth. So just think about the magnitude of all of this, how, how many there are. And yet, using the North Star, one single star as navigation, people can find their way around. So if you take this approach, if you say, I will make the user, the person I'm creating this project, the person I'm delivering this uh, solution for, your North Star, you would be ultimately successful. Uh, the other principle here is continuous delivery and learning. Uh, it's a never ending, it's like we keep enhancing, it's a restless reinvention. We never, we never stop learning and of course the notion of radical collaboration. So what you have in the blue circles, these are more of the principles that come straight from design thinking. And on the bottom in the orange, these are concepts or frameworks or constructs that people associate with agile uh, methodologies. And of course we have here customer collaboration, working deliverables, rapidly adjusting, rapidly responding to change, and valuing interactions and individuals over documentation. Again, we never say no documentation. It's mostly about the individuals and the users. So this is what broadly design thinking and agile uh, have in common. And of course, we'll go into much, much more detail. As I said, it's a whole brain activity. Uh, so make sure that if anyone's arguing with you, you just say, in order to be successful in 2017. Uh, and uh, that's how the alignment is. Um, there's a quote here that we like to refer over and over again. The last best, best experience anyone has anywhere becomes the minimum you expect. So think about it. Think about, think about buying something on Amazon. Think about buying something from Zappos. The idea here is that once you have a satisfying experience, once you have something that is efficient, effective, and that has delivered on what, you tr that has delivered on what you're trying to achieve, uh, you no longer expect anything less. That's why very strongly user-centered companies who focus on the users very successfully, they gain much, much more. Um, another way of seeing this is nowadays the only thing that's left for people to compete on is this whole idea of the customer experience. Uh, you know, things have gone as fast as they can probably go. Things have gone probably as cheap as they, so you can't really compete too much on price or too much on uh, speed. It's all about experience. So today we'll look at, as we talk about design thinking, there are certain artifacts that get associated with this framework. Uh, if you want to learn more about design thinking in detail, I strongly recommend IBM.com slash design slash thinking. Yes, I do work for IBM and we are a leader in IBM design thinking. Uh, back to the presentation. So we have this stakeholder map. Um, it's analyzing who your stakeholders are and what matters to them. If some people on the call are more familiar with business analysis or maybe project management methodologies, you would be familiar with things like the RACI model. Uh, responsible, accountable, uh, and informed. Uh, then we have another artifact, which is the empathy map, the scenario map, story map, wireframes, prototypes. So uh, I can go on for four days describing all the artifacts. I just want to show you some of them and much more on the relationship. The relationship between what happens 
in the design thinking part of the process and what happens in the agile part of the process rather than going into each artifact in great, great detail. So what happens here is that these are co-creation artifacts and this is the mapping on this slide as you see. Uh, an empathy map gets transitioned into user stories and from there we go more into this is like a Kanban task board and the actual product that gets delivered through Agile. And we'll keep we'll keep coming to this. The consistent part here is focus on the user. In the empathy we talk about who the user is, what they say, do, think and feel. And when we move to the user stories we talk about constructs like, as a type of user, I need to be able to do something so that there will be this result. And again, consistent focus on the user. The user is who are we, who are we, who are we developing for, the user is whose experience we are changing. Um, the story map and the as is maps, um, actually I'll go into more detail on this. Back to, or reinforcing, reinforcing the idea that design thinking and agile share the same values. Trust, empathy, respect, courage. When you look at all of those, and you can be looking at them on the screen, it's the idea of putting users, not the requirements, not, not the features. Not, um, so when you think about it, we're not talking about let's say Liz, Elizabeth is our user, uh, we're not talking about what kind of features or what kind of dashboards or what does she see on her screen. We are much more interested in what her current pain points are in the context of what she needs to do. If she needs to, let's say, um, if it's a student loan application or if she's filing her taxes or if she's applying for social security, or whatever she might be doing, or if she's doing something as simple as purchasing something online, uh, we're not necessarily interested in product-centric design, it's in human-centric design. So design thinking helps us move from product to experience, and agile helps us move from requirements if you would like and it's much more than that like really understanding what needs to be delivered to accommodate uh, this experience and how because I mean some of you I have certainly been part of projects that take forever and by the time they get delivered two years behind schedule no one wants them no one wants them because from the very start there was no focus on the user, and no one really took the time to understand what the users need, what their pain points are, and how the new outcome or the new solution can help them. So remember design thinking and agile, about the users, about flexibility, and sharing these key values that you see on your screen. Uh, going further to those shared principles, uh, you have clarity, clarity of the outcome, and this guides us in every single iteration, in every step of the way. And everything is iterate, iterate, iterate. Uh, we bring cross-functional teams and we learn from each other. And uh, we keep enhancing after each iteration. And then, so it's clarity of outcome, and then uh, iteration and learning, our work is iterative and fast, flexible and adaptive. That's very, very agile principles. The idea of self-directed teams, build teams with the right skills and encourage innovation and accountability. So these are the shared principles. And now I'll go a little bit more in the whole idea of what design is. Today, for the purposes of this presentation, and when we talk about design thinking, we're not referring about visual design or fashion design or anything that is focused only on the external or colors or anything like that. Design thinking is about solving difficult problems. 
solving, it's a framework for solving difficult problems. Some of the projects that I work on uh, have to do with societal issues, like trying to prevent the opioid drug crisis. Um, yes, we do work on portals and websites and uh, mobile applications, and sometimes uh, we actually do a lot of visual design. However, I want you to remember design thinking is about solving problems. Um, and as we're solving these problems, we must solve the specific one, and let's evaluate how effective it is at solving this problem. That's where the principles of agility help us, because we keep learning at each additional sprint. We learn more and more what users need, what they want, and how to achieve this. And uh, taking time, taking time to define the problem, to define the problem in the beginning so that we are solving the right problem. Probably we'll have some questions uh, later on because you'll be like, hey, if you spend too much time, uh, even before you start your sprint, how much you're spending it on your first iteration or even on playback zero. And I will, I will, I will talk about this a little bit more. So defining the design challenge, uh, you can read, you can actually probably read this uh, better than me going through all of this. It has to be significant. It has to be aspirational. It cannot be just something that we do routinely in our matter of course. Uh, in design thinking, we talk about the concept of hills, H-I-L-L, -L, and what's a hill? It's the outcome, and it has three components. The who, like who is the user whose experience we're changing, uh, the what, what is changing, and the wow, W-O-W. -W. How is this experience really significantly changing the for the user. Uh, the most famous hill in history is from President Kennedy when he says we're going to send a man to the moon and bring him back to Earth safely. So you have the who, the what, and the wow in this process. And again, the second bullet expressed to meet the unique needs of the individual it can be measured. When I talk about the wow, the wow factor can be measured. For example, somebody must, somebody would be able to get a dashboard with self-service analytics and get all the needed inputs within 24 hours. Or actually, with dashboards, with dashboards, it's probably real time. Or whatever your measure is, you just have to. Um, you just have to have the appropriate measures. And as it says here on my slide, it can be applied to a wide range of products, services, anything could, can that needs to be optimized for human interaction. Okay? So some people, this kind of sums up what we are really talking about and the journey from image, from, describing, envisioning, analyzing the experience goals. So if you start from the left-hand side, where it says product goals, and I keep saying experience because it's actually, it's bigger than product, it's the experience. And then you have your user or your persona, and you understand the demographic, psychographic, technographic characteristics of this user. Uh, what that means is, what kind of age group your user is? What kind of what kind of what kind of the technology background they have? Uh, what kind of education, skills, access, uh, and all of this we need to know about the user. Is then we are going into empathy exercise, really putting ourselves in the shoes of the user. The best way of doing this is through narrative and through stories, storytelling. Uh, people love numbers, yet people remember the stories. Uh, so it's much more qualitative at this point. 
And then we write the heels. The heels are the outcomes, the, the vision, the statement of outcome. Remember the who, the what, and the wow. We have this whole notion of playback. Playback in this kind of terminology has to do with are we all aligned? Are we all on the same page? Are we all marching, if you would like, or are we all moving together to the same goal? Did I hear you correctly? Did I understand you correctly? And in an iterative environment, these can get re refined. Uh, a story map or journey map is what we want the journey to be. And it has two aspects today, the as this scenario, how are things today uh, with different steps? What is the user doing, thinking, feeling at each of these steps? And then how is this changing in a future to be scenario? Uh, what kind of opportunities for improvements they are? So all of this gets happens in a way in the design thinking part of this map. And even though they are separated and there are two colors, um, from the very, very start, and I often get this question, uh, people work together. So it's not like the designers go in, you know, on one island and the agile people go on the other island. Uh, nothing like that. We have teams that are integrated from the very, very start. And we have everyone working together on this. And then we get to this notion of playback zero. This is when we realize or agree on what will be developed. And then we go into the different sprints. And as you see here from my sprints, they can be of different durations. And uh, they can have also, depending on what are we trying to achieve, they can have different time frames. Uh, at the end of each sprint, we have delivery playback and uh, to make sure that we're still aligned with where we're trying to go. So this is kind of the end-to-end -end map of how design thinking matches. I mean, design thinking is mapped to agile uh, delivery. I wanted to, maybe this is kind of like going a little deeper or going further. Uh, the whole idea behind this is that we have divergent and convergent thinking. And yeah, I'm using a slide from Forrester Research. Uh, as you start at the end of the map I was showing you, you have research, uh, understanding your users, ethnography, user interviews, surveys, all sorts of different UX research methods that you generate your divergent ideas, then you analyze, converge on one outcome, one problem statement, and then you further ideate, prototype, and test. So this is how the paradigm of divergent, diverge first, then converge. Generate as many ideas as you can. Go for quantity. Um, <coughs> Excuse me, it can even encourage the absurd. Um, sometimes the best, the best ideas come from when people feel free to, to even encourage the absurd and, and come up with ideas. Um, there's a person who goes with no need for an introduction. And the statement here is design is not what it looks. Design is how it works. And I would say it's more like design is how it works for particular users in specific context and really helps the notion of user-centered design. Going back to some of the principles of what is design thinking all about, uh, this is an example of one of our studios. As you probably see here, it's very, very, like we write on walls, and everyone participates. So participation, creativity are great ideas. We use the framework of user-centered design, identifying a specific problem. And if you're addressing the wrong problem, you're really not giving people what they need. Uh, this is a, another view of one of our studios, just to give you a sense of what design thinking session 
all looks about and the artifacts I was talking about in the beginning of the session, you see them on the wall. Why, is, why are we even talking about design thinking in Agile today or in 2017? Because the smallest changes can help. So when you see, when, what you're seeing on this slide is that um, this lady, the, the user in the picture, has difficulty climbing the steps and a simple solution is to make it easier, stay agile. Um, there are a lot of predictions that, well, not predictions, it's the reality of life that a new generation is coming in the workforce and they're bringing new habits, new ways of working together and people have to be prepared. So in many ways, the millennials are already almost by nature because uh, the way, almost by nature, they are already agile and uh, if we can help them integrate design thinking into all of this, it would be great. Uh, what are you seeing here is a very basic of fundamental. Not basic as in simple, but basic as in foundational. Uh, you have a bicycle, and a bicycle has different parts, components uh, that make the bicycle. Yet, in design thinking and uh, the way we're describing it in its relationship to Agile, it's not about any, about the, any of those components. It's all about the experience. So it's, we're not gonna be talking about handles and brakes. Of course, these are important, uh, yet you can deliver the best, the best pedal or the best wheel. If you don't have an integrated experience, you're probably not reaching your goals. So when we, uh, when we combine design thinking and agile delivery, we aim to deliver great user experiences like this uh, mountain biking person here. And uh, also they're personalized. It's not a one size fits all. So these are all bicycles. And uh, you don't need me to tell you that all of these experiences are very, are very unique and very much based on the needs of the certain user. So um, in order to deliver on this, we have this notion of the loop, observe, reflect, make. What you need to, if you wanna remember something, it's, this is continuous, it can be, and observing is about putting yourself in the user's world, then you're reflecting and you're trying to understand the situation. And then in making, you're creating prototypes, jumping in, giving forms to ideas. And the, the earlier you start, the earlier you start, the faster you will learn. Um, and this whole notion of um, even, you know, in Agile, there's a lot of talk about uh, fail fast or very fast learn what you need to be, what you need to be solving. Here are the principles of design thinking. Focus on users, make them the North Star. Bring different perspectives. Be, bring, do not only have the same type of people on your team. Bring different multidisciplinary teams. Foundation of mutual trust and respect. And then definitely encourage people towards action. Restless reinvention. Keep reinventing, I mean, keep, 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 keep searching for new solutions. Uh, I talked about heels when I was saying the who, what, and wow. Uh, the playback is this notion of alignment and time to reflect together so that everyone it has the same vision. Everyone is in the same, has the same understanding of what the ultimate goal is. Uh, this notion of sponsor user, this is the um, third component on this slide, is people who have lived in experiences, who bring domain expertise to the team. I have a current example from my work. Uh, we work with the Transportation Security Administration. Uh, these are the people at airports who assure our safe traveling experience. 
we talk, we did a lot of research, we talked to some of the project leaders, and we got a lot of information. Yet, the best and the most profound insights came from when we actually were able to speak to the people in uniform, the people who are there 24 hours a day at the airport. And so sponsor users are actual people who have, who perform the tasks. Uh, so if I'm developing something for the, let's say for Wimbledon, I will be incorporating sponsored users. So I'll talk to uh, tennis players and uh, people, maybe coaches, people who have these experiences. So this was the introduction to design thinking. Uh, very briefly, very brief, uh, briefly, our uh, introduction to agile methodology. Um, of course, the manifesto. I am not going to uh, read the um, the entire agile manifesto to you. Uh, it's important to keep stressing the in, the strategic and the focus on the user, the focus on the user. And uh, as in the manifesto, for those of you who might have not seen it before, there's value on the items on the right. And of course, we value from an agile perspective, the items on the left, the items on blue, uh, much, much more. And they are much more aligned with uh, design thinking uh, principles. So, um, this one is probably way more than most of you on the call uh, wanted to uh, see. Maybe what you'll get from this slide is that there are multiple agile methods and they're becoming an all of this. So you have the manifesto as the umbrella of all the methods. And then you have the different methods. So for example, um, I'm a scrum master, or, and I also do uh, yeah, XP. And then you have SAFE that's becoming um, much more prevalent, especially in government nowadays, actually in the whole industry. So all of this, when I say agile, I would mean, and I'm trying to be absolutely correct because I want to, you know, I want it to be quotable. So uh, I would mean the umbrella of the agile uh, methods. And depending on your project, you will be using one or uh, more of that. And it kind of depends on your, on exactly where you are in the life cycle and uh, um, what your particular industry is and what, what specifically uh, you're trying to. And then you have the different principles and uh, practices that that empower or encourage these. Um, so here is the idea, some of you who might come from traditional project management, that you have time, scope, and uh, you have fixed requirements. Actually, this is a important thing to highlight. In a more traditional project management or development methodology, uh, the constraints of resources, time, and different features or, or scope here is viewed very, very differently. Uh, you have fixed requirements and everything is plan-driven. So very often, not that people really want to do that, but let's say sometimes. Sometimes the plan, people do things because it's in the plan. And what happens in Agile, it's flipped on its side and it becomes all about the value. It's not about what the plan or, it's more about what value can I deliver to my users and how can I enhance their experience. So that's what we mean by the triple constraint is managed differently. Um, this slide here shows you in an agile basics what happens. You have product backlog, and then you have the iteration backlog, and then you have the different sprints, and the uh, you have the different sprints
Oh, Vera, I think you cut out there for a second. I think second. something happened to our audio. Oh. Um, just a second. I will try to get back to... Uh, how do I get back to the phone call? I'm so sorry. Oh, it's fine. You're actually very clear right now, so we can. Just okay. Keep... All right. So I'll keep, I'll keep talking this way. Um, yeah. No problem. Um, so um, next slide. Uh, this is scaling agile for multiple agile teams. So in addition to the the one product release, you have multiple iteration, multiple sprints. Uh, so I'm giving you a sense here on this slide that it's scalable. Some people have this notion that Agile doesn't scale across the enterprise and doesn't scale properly across the enterprise. And this slide is showing that that notion is not quite uh, true. So back to, back to why we're here, integrating design thinking and Agile. After taking the journey to understanding what design thinking and agile actually are now we are to the integration point we saw this one before hope now people feel a little bit more um it's like oh now i know what she means when she talks about the persona and the hill and the hill playback and the playback zero and the sprints and um, so maybe this is the money slide the kind of like the cornerstone slide, you have the hill of what we'll be achieving. So when it says here, one hill, we talk about delivering products with three hills. Why three? Because anything more loses focus. And again, what was the hill? It was the who, what, and wow. And then these hills can be broken into sub-hills or scenarios. And from the, the hills, so everything here that's on the left-hand side, these are design thinking language, if you would like. And then on the right-hand side, we have the agile language. Now, I'm making this artificial um, distinction or selection here because, as I keep saying, it's all integrated. So the hill gets broken into sub-hills. Then they become epics, and then they become stories. And then the stories get estimated, and from there, they get prioritized and uh, delivered. Um, a lot of you if, you, if you, if you work with Agile, uh, you're familiar with the notion of MVP. So here we're showing the stages of how in an agile process, I wouldn't be delivering the first layer of the wedding cake. It's more of the notion of having cupcakes at this stage and then delivering the wedding cake. It's a it's a it's a it's a transform it's a transformative. So if I'm building the so but these are usable, these are usable products and they have MVP value at each stage the cupcake the birthday cake and eventually you have a wedding cake which has a lot of um, so the differences and they deliver different ideas and actually it's the build-up of this okay um this also shows the integration between how design and agile development and what we are stressing here, what we want to pay attention to, is that we have design within each sprint. So design doesn't stop. It's not. It doesn't stop at iteration zero. It doesn't stop at sprint zero. It doesn't, uh, as you see, it's inside, integrated uh, within each sprint. Uh, the green thing on top, for those of you might be wondering, what is that? Uh, that is our sign or our uh, icon for a hill, how a hill is represented and how it moves through the process. And then uh, when my slide builds, that's why I was like, oh, where, where are the rest of my hills that we will be, uh, we'll be developing? Okay. And then throughout all of this process here, there's constant alignment. There's constant alignment with uh, the stakeholders and 
the sponsored users. Uh, we have the vision and the intent, and then we have the delivery. And actually, I'll show you in the next slide how all of this uh, works together. Uh, here are the playbacks. And when we say story, we mean our understanding. Let's say I'm building a portal for traveling. Let's say I'm building a competitor to Expedia Travelocity. And here it would be humanistic, human focused design. What do people need when they travel? Uh, rather than focusing, I will be showing 13 search results and I will be showing those kinds of images. It's really much more, I want people to be able to plan, research, prepare for their trip and then uh, make the best selection for their trip and then, you know, whatever else we need, but focused on uh, user, focused on user needs. Here are some questions for the delivery feedback. And uh, what this shows us is that we keep saying that there are three hills of what will be delivered. And are we going to build the entire, the notion here is you could be even flexible in the delivery of the three hills. Are we going to go hill one, hill two, hill three, or are we going to go with minimum viable product one and then minimal viable product three, and then and only then return back to the hill two. And we're asking here, do we need to even throw out a hill? So we're even engaging or we entertaining this notion that we started with three things, three outcomes, and through the process, through the agile process, we figured out it's much better to actually eliminate that second hill and go with one and three. So um, that's in the spirit of time. We can we can talk more and more about this. I would love to uh, take some some questions. The key takeaways: make users a north star, practice empathy, solve difficult problems through engaged, diverged, and convergent thinking, and co-create with your clients. So what happens with all of this? Your clients are part of the conversation. Um, if we ask the question, are design thinking and agile working together? Absolutely. Design thinking and agile, a successful partnership to deliver effective solutions to our users. And uh, this is the one that says IBM design thinking, let's think together. I will take questions and actually, uh, I will take questions at this point, yes. Great, thank you, Vera. Um, Yes, we definitely have a couple questions here, and uh, I'm going to drop the link to our Slack team here again for folks. But um, I think the first question is actually around the hills. So if you wouldn't mind, um, could you switch to the slide? Uh, I think it was in the middle where you looked at how the hills broke out into the sub hills and then the, the epics and the, mm -hmm. the individual okay. sprints. So somebody was trying to just get a better grasp on, on what a hill is from a practical standpoint. So could you give an example of what, so what might a hill be from uh, from your work at IBM and then what might a sub hill be and, and what a scenario and how that may break out uh, that uh, way. If there's any examples you could attach to yeah, let me terminology see. Yeah. terms here. Um, if you give me one second, let's see if I can go directly to this. Can you see this screen? Yep, perfect. Okay. So, um, and let's see if I can show it uh, in a better mode or l let's just look at this. So, um, a hill is Sarah. So, this is a shopping example. And a hill is Sarah. This is the who. She can do something. She can do a quick search for all things she wants to buy on a website and get enough information for a decision. And then a sub hill would be she's comparing the prices. And then she's doing a quick search. So that is my hill. Then the scenario here is, as you can see it, she is searching for what she wants on the website and she's getting some good suggestions. Then that scenario is also my epic. The searching for what she wants and getting suggestions. And then the first story is 
choosing a dress and actually the ability. This is the shopping cart. This is the putting a dress in a shopping cart and comparing the prices. And the second story is logging in. And then, of course, you have the tasks. Uh, this is uh, like uh, a shopping example. Most people can relate to a shopping example. Um, I hope this illustrates the, the, the progression and the relationship between the hill and the actual going, taking it all the way um, to, the, to a task level. No, this is, this is fantastic. I think this is perfect and exactly what the person was, uh, was asking about here. So let's go to the next question, which is, which is really more about, um, about narrative. So somebody here is curious, could you explain uh, why narrative is the best way to empathize with the user? Okay, so um, that's, that's a great question. And actually it's a quote from, this will be more uh, US centered, but um, there's a national public radio, NPR, Ira Glass. Uh, so this is one of his, uh, it's, it's a, for those of you who are not familiar, it's a radio show. And this is one of his, uh, it's called This American Life. And it features different people and different stories about people. And one of his famous quotes is a narrative storytelling empowers you to gain empathy but let me let me actually explain it rather than saying where it comes from um people it's a psychological factor if you would like uh people relate to a like objects like um and people remember attributes about about people. So if I tell you, a st and by story, actually that will probably be interesting for you to learn, all the literature in the world and all the movies, all the movie scripts, uh, they did some analysis and it boiled down to six major, I mean, six major stories. You have a hero or a person going on a journey, then he or she encounters difficulties, and then um, then he slays them. But more practical. So let's say we are working on improving a web uh, analytics solutions for a principal of a high school. And if I tell you the principal needs a dashboard for his students, I mean, that, that's good, you know, and principal needs dashboard. But then if I tell you something like this, you know, Mary Jane is a 57-year-old principal. She's been, you know, in this high school. She's been the headmaster of this high school. She's very tired. And, and I, will, I will give you much more context, much more information. And I will tell you what keeps her up at night. So she's sitting there in her apartment uh with her cats i don't know maybe she has dogs but but i'm telling you all of this and then then this person who just needed a dashboard now you're feeling her pain that not her not having this information at her fingertips she doesn't know like, how her school is performing she doesn't know how her students are performing so it creates a little bit more intimacy and a lot more immediacy so that's why we talk about customer journey map a journey map what's a journey map it can be a day in the life of like this morning i woke up and everything that happened to me in relationship to this problem not not in no not in my whole universe but to it creates it makes it come alive so uh, more questions yes absolutely so um, so the next question is really about the timing of user testing. At IBM right now in your projects, what is the cadence of usability testing within the sprints? Do you do them after each sprint? Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about the scheduling for user testing. Uh, so we try to do user testing as early and as often as possible. It's part of our reflect and explore a part. Uh, so we, uh, in terms of the sprints, we do them at the end of, of each sprint. Uh, you have to understand, uh, we have projects that, 
have shorter durations. We have, so I can't give a general generalized answer on the timing of a project, but more on the sequence. So yes, things get tested. Things get tested uh, at after the playback within the sprint, and uh, now the extent to which get to which they get tested depends on the types of users and the types of requirements. Most of the stuff I do is government, public sector, so it would be uh, all, the, all the federal agencies and then Army, Navy, Air Force. So my, my systems, my applications have very strict accessibility, Section 5 or 8 compliance. So in addition to usability testing, we also do accessibility testing. Uh, so yes, we do testing within each sprint, and it depends how much testing on what the project is. And we try to do testing with real, real users. That's that's a kind of a key component of this. Right. Uh, the next question that we have here is: Would you say that at IBM, your overall design process is similar to dual track agile, where you have um, discovery and and um, implementation sprints happening at the same time. Uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit just about the overall structure. Uh, yes. So the short answer is uh, yes. And uh, we also have projects that build upon each other. And we have projects that, uh, for example, we might be working with one agency for, for many, many years. So um, let me see what else I can say about this one. Uh, we try to, I was thinking of a current project right now. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, research. Uh, we're in the user segment, user interviews, and uh, ethnography part of it. While some of my solutions architect and some of my uh, agile developers are also um, yeah, they're also working on this as well. So the answer would be the answer would be yes. Yeah. Got it. And someone here is curious about if you could, as a follow up, um, could you shed some light on your process for accessibility testing? So this person is actually interested to know um, how you recruit users for accessibility testing and, and also uh, just how that gets executed within your sprints. Uh, absolutely. Can we do a whole other session on accessibility testing? And I'm not being funny or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's a great topic. So to give you a very quick answer, um, we, we work with, for example, you probably know there are agencies that are that can provide you like agencies like respondent or user works or um, so we have our own databases of people and we also work with outside agencies who do recruitment so I send them a screener uh, like a set of questions that says we need this particular type of user and they can recruit these users now for the more specific ones we have relationships with uh, different associations different organizations that uh, focus on specific types of types of people and we also very aware that uh, like let me see if I have a good example um, we did some banking applications for uh, I mean th th there's so many examples so uh, we work with recruitment not like you know not employer recruitment user recruitment testing agencies and then we work through universities and for example AARP American Associations of Retired Persons they can give us different users or there are different organizations that can help with this and uh, we have a very um, we have a very well established accessibility center and I can uh, we uh, send more information on that uh, the, the the point of this I'm trying to make is that we try to test with the appropriate user for the application uh, meaning if I keep testing with users who will not ultimately be my target users there's probably not a lot of value in that and of course we use uh, we use screen read, I mean, we use different technologies and that, that gets into more interesting things like when the user comes, does he or she bring 
laptops, her own cell phone and her own equipment? And the answer is yes, because they are already used and customized. And then probably the follow-up question would be, well, what if you have a very sophisticated prototype and then how do you balance all of this? And uh, then, it becomes, then it becomes even more interesting and challenging. And we try to, we try to get, uh, we try to get people to, to test for accessibility. Great. The next question is a much broader question, which, um, which is really about at IBM, how did, how did IBM in general manage to standardize this process into what you described today, um, especially since it was so engineering driven before? What were some of the initiatives that were required to change the mindset and culture and get people to start following this more balanced, you know, design and agile methodology? That's a great, great question. Uh, so um, it's part of our transformation story uh, that started with Phil Gilbert and IBM Design in Austin, Texas. And when I say IBM transformation story, uh, we did a, actually this was before I joined IBM, they did a word cloud and people were giving words like computers and mainframe and uh, things like that. And they realized that that's not the IBM, that that's not the new IBM. Uh, so in a way, I am actually, this week is my second year at IBM. I'm part of the 1,000 designers. Actually, it's more than 1,000 designers. So I'm part of the new IBM. I'm part of the people that IBM went out and hired design researchers, design ethnographers, uh, and UX people, and people like us to, to, to keep changing the culture. Um, but how is it done? We have IBM Design Thinking University. We have a badging system. So for design thinking and also for agile, we have different levels or different statuses you can achieve. You can be a practitioner, leader, coach, master. So people were encouraged to keep attaining different levels. Uh, we have 40, uh, 42 studios around the world. The reason I took, a, uh, because they keep, the studios keep growing. Uh, I guess the, the answer would be, Phil Gilbert reports to the highest level of the company, and then it's spread across the whole company. From the moment people enter IBM, like the newest hires, they're given design thinking training, uh, design thinking and agile training uh, uh, made as a requirement for everyone. So it's a very consistent uh, method and approach, and it's driven both from the top down and also through all of us, kind of bottoms up. And, I, you know, I'm very, very proud to be part of this new, uh, new organization. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, that was a, that's a great answer. So the next question is sort of related, which is someone, uh, this person is curious. So could you shed some light on the structure of design teams at IBM? And as a part of that, also um, maybe mention, is there, a, is there a certain ratio that exists between developers and designers at IBM? That depends. Okay, so we have two types of, that, that's a great question. Uh, we have two types of design teams or two types of design studios as well. Uh, the one type is more product centric. So we design different products and then we have more services centered. So uh, I particularly, my organization is on the services side. So um, the ratio when you have on the product side, they have more developers and well relatively more developers uh and on our site we tend to have more designers but on the product side i believe it's one design thinking person to eight developers uh, you know it would depend on the project and i don't uh, the best answer i will actually i would stop at that some of them are more product centric they have more developers some of them are more service centered and we have more uh on the service centered side we have more customer experience people more designers and less developers and then the actual ratio depends on the uh, specific project 
Got it. And since we are coming up on the end of the hour, we will take the last question here, which um, which I think is a is a good one to actually close out not just the session but the entire um, the entire summit on. And and that is in your experience. What tactics have you found to be useful for working with uh, product managers or even stakeholders who are very focused on features? They remind them the vision and the mission. Remind them what keeps people at night. And remind them that if we are working for social security administration for example it's not about how many or let's say if we are working for irs and people need to do their taxes it's not about lines on screens it's not about like it's much more at the end of this when the person processes his or her tasks remind them about the users and remind them about the goal and the mission and that's how you say hey you're changing the experience it's not about product uh in my experience what has happened after they've been through a couple of projects they do they do get it and actually jerry i would like to hear your answer to this question or maybe somebody else from the audience <laughs> yeah so um so you know in our experience at, at ux pin from you know, this is this is me uh, hearing from a lot of the folks who who we have hired now uh, in either product or design roles. What they have found to be useful is really, um, you know, uh, really just an incremental process in terms of getting these folks on board with the value of design and the design process. Which is, uh, in their experience, they found that showing them that this process is an experiment, right, and then um, getting them involved at small steps along the way, focusing first on uh, projects that may have the most impact for their life. So for instance, if a, if a project manager is working on a certain um, solution and there is something that just can't be figured out, well, that might be a good opportunity for introducing a different process for that because the current process already isn't working. Uh, and then through a series of um, just light education and, and light activities, start to get them to see the value of design instead of throwing it all on them at, at once. Um, you know, in my experience and, and also that of my coworkers, we found that that works much better than trying to show people, hey, here's this amazing new design thinking process that we're gonna roll across and, and here's, the, here's the huge vision for that. It's, it's been more of um, sort of baby steps there. And on that note, uh, since we are over time, um, Vera, thank you so much for giving us uh, some of your time on a Friday afternoon here. Um, it was a really insightful presentation into how IBM has managed to find the balance between these two worlds and, uh, you know, of course, change the process and perception of IBM from being just an engineering conglomerate into an organization that actually uh, uses design at the center of its product development. And uh, thank you for everybody who's joined today's session, as well as for all of these sessions through the week. Um, it's hard to believe this is the last session of Agile UX uh, Virtual Summit 2017, but it's been a lot of fun having everybody here join us along for the past four days. And uh, we will have all of the sessions uploaded as well as sent to, uh, to everybody in their emails next week. It will come as a batch email, so that way you guys can have that on hand for future reference. Uh, that includes the slides as well. And uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Um, Vera, thanks again for, uh, for the presentation. All right. And with that, we will close it out. Take care, everybody.